Perfect. Well, thanks to everybody who's joining us today. We've got some folks in the room here at the State Archives, as well as some folks joining us online. And um, this is going to be a housing needs meeting for the Greater Nashville Regional Coalitions area. So we'll have folks, you know, kind of from a lot of different places in the region. And um, my name is Amara Mattingly. I'm the senior research analyst on the research and planning team at THDA. And um, I just want to welcome everybody, tell you we're glad that you are joining us. I also want to give a quick shout out here to, let's see if I can move forward. There we go. To uh, Pete, he's up here in the front row. I talked to Pete earlier this summer to organize this and he and Michelle were kind enough to help us promote it and also just, um, you know, provide that like regional organizing for this area. And then I also want to uh, thank Cynthia and Elizabeth here from the Tennessee State Archives. They worked with us to be in this lovely space. And so we're really glad that y'all are joining us. I do want to note really quickly as we get started, there are slide numbers that are down in the bottom corner. And so at the end of the presentation, we're going to do a Q&A. And if, if there's something you want to return to and talk about, just uh, maybe note the slide number. There's a lot of um, graphs and visuals in here that um, we might want to reference. So I just want to alert you to that. All right. So jumping right in, um, this meeting is a part of the consolidated planning process that the state goes through. And I just want to make sure that folks know a little bit about what that is before we get started. So the state of Tennessee is our application for about 50 to $60 million in federal funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the, um, the state of Tennessee then distributes that between the consolidated planning programs, which are the Community Development Block Grant, the Emergency Solutions Grant, Home Investment Partnership, the Housing Trust Fund, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with HIV and AIDS. But more broadly, we use the consolidated planning process as a way to find out more from folks who are working in the housing space or who are living in communities across the state about what their needs are related to housing. And so it's we're kind of doing both things as we're, you know, doing this more formalized process for HUD, but we also want to make sure that we're taking the time to learn more about what you all are seeing. And that's where the focus group piece is going to come in. Um, just a little word about the consolidated planning programs. CDBG is focused on infrastructure projects. These projects must benefit um, areas with more than half low income households. And that's overseen by um, the Tennessee uh, Economic, I always say ECD, Economic and Community Development Department agency. Um, and then the three in the middle are overseen by THDA. So the home program mostly is focused on single family rehabilitation and building, although they do some small rural rentals now. Um, the housing trust fund is focused on affordable um, multifamily and the emergency solutions grant is focused on homelessness uh, programs and services. Uh, home, The home housing is geared toward um, households that are at 80% AMI or less. The housing trust fund is at the extremely low income, is focused on extremely low income households. That's 30% AMI or less. And ESG doesn't have um, income, but of course, if you're experiencing homelessness, that often means that you don't have a lot of resources. Um, and then HOPWA is is seen by or overseen by the Department of Health. That is a mostly a housing subsidy program for families um, who, like one person, has HIV or AIDS. So before we get started, I definitely want to make sure that I highlight that we want to come at this uh, discussion with a spirit of humility and also like wanting to make sure that we're taking time to learn more about the strengths in your community. So the data that you're going to see today will not completely, and it may not even accurately sometimes, capture the needs of the community. The best data we have is unfortunately always going to be out of date. So you're mostly going to be seeing the most up-to-date data from the American Community Survey in 2022. And that survey is going to be subject to sampling error. So 
when we get to the Q and A piece, like if you hear something that I'm presenting and you're like, you know, I don't know if that really matches what we're experiencing in our agency. Like we definitely want to hear that. We want to see what you notice in the data, what you feel like does accurately capture what you're seeing and what might seem off, um, as well as anything that you think might be missing. And then as I noted about the strengths, like this data that we're gonna present is focused on need. It's not going to capture the strengths in communities, especially things like the community being close knit, having a generational connection to the community or the land, um, having a unique culture. And so that's a piece that we hope that you all will tell us more about based on your work in the focus groups. And that just isn't something that we're able to cover um, because we don't know all of it. And then finally, um, well, I just would have repeated myself. Okay, so here's our agenda for today. We're gonna start out with the housing needs presentation as well as a Q&A. And um, that piece will be for all of us in the room as well as the folks online. Uh, Dothry is gonna be monitoring the chat for the, for the folks that are um, online so that they are able to ask questions and we'll make sure that both groups can engage. And then at the end, the folks who are here in person, we hope that you will join us for the um, focus groups afterward. We're going to do one on housing affordability as well as uh, homelessness. All right, so let's jump into the content. So today we're gonna to be talking about the different components that go with the housing needs environment. And of course, this is going to encompass the current populations and households, so who currently lives in an area, as well as what are their household incomes, like how are they resourced? Um, and then the current housing supply, as well as those housing prices. We're gonna be looking at kind of how those two things um, go together. But then of course we need to be thinking about that, you know, future population um, that is going to be coming or leaving an area and um, what that means for the future housing supply. And then lastly, we want to talk about how all of these things interact um, and how this sometimes can create an environment where people experience housing stability and look at some trends and what's happening in housing stability, especially as we consider what's happening in other areas of the housing needs environment. So the framework we're gonna work with is we're gonna start out looking at what the region is like now, who lives here, the current housing supply and how much that housing costs. And then we're going to look at what housing is needed, how do we know we need it? Um, and then we're gonna talk about what happens if the housing isn't built and which households are experiencing instability. And the pieces that we hope that you all will help us with is understanding more about what the challenges are for building housing in your areas, as well as like what strategies you all are using to enable people to find that housing. Um, or if you work in the homelessness uh, space, especially like what strategies are you using to address current instability or prevent future instability? Okay, so we're gonna start with the current populations and households, and we're gonna be looking at this um, from a development district level, and then we'll zoom in a little bit more and look at some of the counties in GNRC. Okay, so this probably won't be a surprise to anyone, but GNRC, the Greater Nashville Regional, or the Greater Nashville Region, um, is the most populous region in the state, has about 2 million people in the development district, and this is quite a bit more populous than many of the other areas. Even our second and third largest cities um, are only, you know, may, are half the size maybe. Um, and then we have a lot of rural parts of the states as well. And if you look at this map here, you can see that there's kind of this, uh, the gray boundaries that shows areas of density. So even some of the rural areas, of course, have some towns and cities. Um, but you can see here that the Nashville Metroplex um, and Murfreesboro, Gallatin, Lebanon, Clarksville, you know, we have a lot of really dense areas in the greater Nashville area. But then there are also uh, places adjacent to these cities that are um, rural. So we're really looking at both areas encompassed within GNRC, even though it's quite populous. This region has also really experienced a lot of growth. So 
you're, we're going to be using these little triangles to show how things have changed. And this is within the last five years. So from 2017 to 2022 is what we're looking at here. GNRC's uh, population has grown by 10 and a half percent. And you can see that that is more quick than um, some of the other areas you see in West Tennessee. Things are um, they're either losing a little bit of population or uh, gaining very slightly. And the central uh, the Middle Tennessee region has really experienced a lot of growth, and um, the eastern region has as well, just at a slower rate. And then if we hone in on what's happening kind of in the different counties, you can see here that that 10.5% is uh, especially driven by some of the um, like the counties that are surrounding Davidson. So although Davidson has grown four and a half or four point six percent over the last five years, you can see that Williamson um, has a seventeen point three percent growth rate. Rate Rutherford fifteen point two, Wilson fifteen point seven, Sumner twelve percent, Montgomery fifteen point seven. So there are many like kind of. Um, surrounding communities that have experienced really rapid population growth in the last five years. So now let's take a look at the demographics for the greater Nashville region. So when we look at the age population, about a quarter are children, 22% young adult, middle age 38, and senior adult 13.2. Uh, compared to the rest of the state, this is a slightly like younger population um, distribution overall, skews toward younger. Um, for race and ethnicity, the greater Nashville region is about seven or 69% white, 16% black, 8% uh, Hispanic, and, and this is exclusively Hispanic of all different races, which is why it's all in the same. Uh, stack, and then um, and then all other racial categories that are included are um, in the upper part, so 7.3%. For income distribution, you can see the stacks over there of like what the household incomes are in the region, and you can see that the median is is where that arrow is pointing, and so the median income for GNRC is kind of in the high 60s. I can't remember the exact number. Um, for where people live, if you look at tenure, renters are 35% of households and owners are 65% of households. So it is more common in GNR, the greater Nashville region, to um, own a home uh, compared to renting. And you can kind of see here what the home ownership rate is across the state. So the greater Nashville region is on the lower side for home ownership, um, 65%, as we said. And you can see here that some of the other counties reach up into the 70%. I think South Central is the highest with home ownership rate, which is 74% own a home. And the Mid-South Development District over here is uh, lower than the rest of the state, which is a... Uh, 58%. A lot of our presentation today is going to be thinking of the housing market into two segments then. We're going to start breaking this apart into folks who own a home or are paying a mortgage and folks who are uh, renting. And so you have to just remember that these aren't the same size groups. The owner group is a larger group of people, but this shows kind of for ages where people are at. And so renters tend to be younger, owners tend to be older, it sort of makes sense. You have more time to um, build up the assets to uh, buy a home. And then for our racial demographics, renters tend to be more people of color. So white is 61% of renters, black 26, all others is 12.6, whereas Owner households in the greater Nashville region are 82% white, about 11% black, and other races are 7%. So for incomes, this one, you know, would maybe also be um, pretty intuitive. Like, 
if you have a higher income, you are more likely to be able to be approved for a mortgage um, and make that transition into home ownership. And so you can see that owner households tend to have higher incomes, whereas renter households tend to have lower incomes. I've been using uh, AMI, which is the area median income several times throughout the presentation. And so you can just see a translation here of the incomes into AMI. So area median income, that's like where the middle is. And you can see here the, the different segments of the population. So this matches the income graph. If you make uh, a lower percentage of AMI, then you are more likely to be a renter. If you are you know, higher than the median, above 100%, you're more likely to be an owner. Um, and that kind of frames for us thinking about these two segments, what some of the um, challenges or um, aspects of the housing are going to be for a renter population versus an owner population. Okay, so now we're going to uh, take a look at the supply. And, um, our current housing supply, one of the ways we think about it is we want to make sure that we have enough housing that meets all of the different needs that go across an income spectrum. So you can see here that um, we want to make sure that we have everything from homelessness services all the way to market rate homeownership. And you can see the AMI bands listed below. This doesn't mean that that only that category is going to use that type of housing. But, you know, if if you have less income, you are more likely to get into a situation where you might need supportive housing or homelessness services. Um, and of course, we know that there's kind of a threshold that you have to meet in order to um, be qualified for a mortgage. So you can see that kind of transition in the upper part. And we want to make sure that we have these different pieces of the housing continuum because, of course, you know, we want people to be able to move up the continuum, um, maybe end up purchasing a home to build their savings and equity. But we also want to make sure that if, you know, folks have something that sets them back, which you can see some examples of that down here, that the housing is there um, to, to support them as well. So when we think about the different kinds of structures in the greater Nashville region, we have mostly single family homes. 65.2% are like single family detached houses. Um, and we have 6% that are uh, single family attached. So like, you know, townhomes, condos, that kind of thing. And then um, all the way across different kinds of like multi-unit sorts of complexes including mobile homes and even some residential vehicles. But the most dominant type of housing is the single family home. And the current supply that exists, this, this graph right here is showing housing starts for each year tracked, and this is the entire United States. So part of what's happening right now is we're really struggling with housing supply. And the reason for that is you can see where the dotted red line is, that's the financial crisis. And after that, housing starts really fell off. But of course we have you know, people still growing older, being born, we still have population growth. And so we need more housing, but you can see that we're not building at the same rate that maybe you would expect if the line had continued sort of similar to how it was before the financial crisis. So as a result, the median age of our housing is relatively old because we're not necessarily building a lot that's new. And so you can see here the age of the, the median age of rental housing. So the middle unit, if you, you know, line them all up by age. And um, some of the counties like Stewart, Houston, especially Humphreys, um, they are in the 40s for 40 years old is the median age for the rental housing. And so this is gonna you know, be associated with maybe needed repairs and um, upkeep kinds of costs that go with older housing. Whereas you know, the places where we have a lot of people moving in, there's going to have been more development. You can see Williamson, Rutherford, Wilson um, have a slightly higher or um, more recent median. For owner housing, 
uh, you can see that it's newer than rental housing as far as a median goes. And um, but Davidson has a 41 year median for its uh, owner housing, so significantly older than some of the surrounding counties. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how much that housing costs. And if we think about rents, this is the median rent in 2022 for each county. Um, so you can see here the, the median rent. And then the triangles show you what the percent change has been in the last five years. So, you know, Williamson has a really high median rent. And also that had gone up 33% in the last five years. Uh, Nashville or the Davidson County, ha Davidson County has a, you know, almost $1,400 median rent. And that went up 43% in the last five years. So, you know, um, you'll see here that basically everywhere had rental increases, um, but some counties really had pretty sharp rental increases. And we see some similar things for homes as well. And the growth part is um, especially stark. So you can see here um, that the Middle Tennessee region, especially compared to the rest of the state, tends to have higher median home, um, median sale prices. Um, and you can see that home prices really have gone up a lot uh, within the last five years. If you look at Truesdale, housing prices doubled from five years ago, the median doubled. So not every house, but the median price doubled. Um, and many others, you know, experienced really uh, sharp growth as well in housing prices. Okay, so that's kind of a brief overview of where we're at with people and um, housing supply and costs right now. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, given those things, what housing do we know we need in both the rental space and in the owner space? Okay. So we're going to look for rent at uh, cost burden. So a household that is cost burden spends 30% or more of their incomes on housing. And so you can see here the percentage of renters that are paying more than 30% of their incomes in housing. And so of all the renters for GNRC, 46%, almost half, are paying 30% or more of their incomes in rent right now. And this has increased over the last five years for the region. You can see that there's a 17.6% increase over the last five years in the number of households who are, uh, the share of households who are um, cost burden. And um, you can see that for severe rental cost burden, so this is, this is a household that spends more than 50% of their incomes on rent. About one in five renters, so 20% of renters in the greater Nashville region currently spend more than half of their incomes on rent currently. And that this has similarly increased, 16% increase from five years ago um, for GNRC. This one right here is then showing kind of the same thing for cost burden. Um, at the uh, county level. And there are some areas that you can see where it there the data is showing that potentially the, the percentage of people who are cost burden went down, whereas in other areas it um, increased. And I'm looking at this, I'm actually wondering if percentage might be incorrect. I'm just flagging it for you. I'm looking at it and thinking, I ah, this okay. But you can see that, you know, the for the different counties, cost burden in many of them is quite high, whereas there are some other places that are more affordable. And here's the one for severe cost burden. So you can see Davidson, Williamson, Rutherford, Wilson, Sumner, and Robertson tend to have higher. Uh, severe cost burden 
um, households. Okay, so before we move on to, to homeowner, um, THDA is working on trying to figure out, so if you think about cost burden, right, it's, if you're paying that much in, of your income in rent, th what that means is there's not, um, you're, you're somehow not managing to find a unit that is affordable to you. And there's a couple things that maybe could cause that. One might be that a unit that's affordable to you simply doesn't exist. Uh, another one could be there's not enough of them for the people who are like in your income category, right? Or another thing could be there is enough of them, but maybe um, a higher income person is choosing to live in a less expensive apartment, you know, to help maximize their budget. And um, THDA is working on being able to give some estimates of what's happening in those different uh, scenarios. And we're not ready to share them with you today. But I think of cost burden as being an evidence of a supply issue, because what's happening is families aren't able to find a house that is at an affordable price for themselves. And so that helps us know, OK, we need to be thinking about how do we provide that supply of housing. And so even though I can't give you like the exact breakdown for what's happening in each area, we will be sharing some some research related to that relatively soon. OK, and then in the homeowner space here, um, so the homeowner opportunity index is a better way to look at um, affordability and supply issues for homeownership. Cost burden doesn't work so well for homeownership because, you know, if you're going to qualify for a mortgage, they're kind of means testing uh, the house that you're going to buy. So, you know, um, cost burden tends to be a lot lower in the ownership department, partially because, uh, you know, you're already above a cer certain income threshold to, to make that jump. Um, so a better way to think about homeownership uh, supply is what, like, what percentage of homes that are sold every single year would be affordable to a median income person in an area? Would they have been able to afford it if they were looking? How many, what percentage of the houses? So here you can see that GNRC, and this is in 2022, 31% of the homes that were sold in 2022 are um, affordable to that median income buyer. And you can see here that certain counties especially are hanging out in that 30% range. But if you look at the triangles, um, like Davidson County dropped by 25.8 percentage points. So it used to be that about half of the homes that were sold in Davidson County um, five years ago would have been affordable to the median buyer. Whereas today it's about 33%. And you can see that great big huge drop everywhere within the last five years. And of course, everybody knows that the housing market was really, really tight, especially starting in 2020 and prices went up, et cetera. This is what it's looking like from that median standpoint for folks who might be interested in purchasing a home. So as prices go up and as we struggle to provide the supply that people are asking for um, with housing, you know, we notice that households tend to experience housing instability more often. Um, and so we're going to take a look at um, housing stability sorts of questions in the state. Now, a tricky thing about looking at uh, especially homelessness, is the way that we measure homelessness across the state is at different geographies. It's based on the continuums of care that provide um, services and resources to folks who are experiencing housing instability. And so you can see here that Nashville-Davidson County is its own continuum of care region. Murfreesboro and Rutherford County is also its own continuum of care. But then many of the other counties in the development district, as well as in, um, in the South Central uh, Development District, are all under the same continuum of care. 
So we're going to look at each one of those a little bit to get a feel for what's happening with housing stability. All right, so right here you see for Central Tennessee, so that's that really large geographic area, that um, in the point in time count, which is where folks go out and um, in January and just count how many people they can find who are experiencing homelessness, um, you can see that count over a period of time here. And the part that's dashed out is during the pandemic, um, there was uh, a ch like, the, the methodology that people had to do for the point in time count was uh, more flexible. And so it's unclear like how representative what people found during that time is. So it's blurred out, but kind of think of it as a ten trend line. You can see in central Tennessee, we have a rel relatively stable counts of homelessness, um, except for the, like we had a drop at the end, but if you kind of think about smoothing the line, um, and you can see here we have some of our like vulnerable groups that are also tracked. So out of the people counted, you have the trend line um, that's showing um, black people who are in the point in time count as well as children. So when you compare the population, um, the age population of the continuum of care to what was found during the point in time count, you can see that children and seniors are underrepresented in homelessness and that um, youth and younger adults and middle-aged adults are overrepresented. So it means that kind of middle group in uh, central Tennessee is what we're able to tell is experiencing um, homelessness. And I forgot to mention this up front, but of course, like a point in time count is just, you know, it's just the folks that you're able to see. So it's always an undercount. Every time it will be an undercount. Um, but this is like the best estimate we have for kind of looking for those trends. Uh, and then as far as uh, racial demographics, you can see for the COC on the left, this is the racial distribution here, 82% white, 8% black, all and about 10% other races. But when you look at who is um, included in the point in time age distribution, we know that our black population especially is more likely to be overrepresented or is overrepresented amongst our homeless population. All right, and then you can kind of see a similar trend line. So this is just for the Nashville metro area, similar kind of thing. We had unclear if it was a dip during the pandemic, but relatively stable homelessness um, over the last five years. And then um, for our age distribution, again, similar to before, children, seniors, less represented in the point in time count, middle age, more. Batteries run though. Well, that's fun. My team's going to help me out. That'll be great. Okay. Um, and we have have similar to central ten, uh, the Tennessee region. You can see that um, our black population is overrepresented in the homelessness count. Okay. This is for Murfreesboro and Rutherford. It's not too different. Okay. Um, so age-wise similar and racial-wise similar story. And so these are the kinds of things that we want to keep in mind when we're thinking about how we um, respond to and prevent housing instability is that it's this kind of more middle in, uh, middle age group that seems to be uh, disproportionately experiencing homelessness. It seems to be our black population that's more often experiencing homelessness. And one way that we look at this um, ourselves is we look at teeny tiny, um, or not teeny tiny, but like census tracts. And um, you can see here that the ones that are outlined in red are areas that have concentrated poverty. So that means 40% 
or more of the households that live in that area meet the federal poverty thresholds. When you look at those, you can see that there's one up in Clarksville. There are uh, four that are in the kind of main Nashville area. Um, when you look at those areas and you look at the demographic groups that live there, you can see that um, 52 to 76 percent of the heads of households are part of minor minority racial groups. And so, you know, the homelessness um, overrepresentation that we're seeing really very closely correlates with having fewer resources that, you know, folks who are in um, kind of these lower income categories are more vulnerable. And um, you can even pinpoint, it doesn't necessarily mean that the people from these areas specifically are, you know, what we're seeing in the point in time count, but we would be looking to see, okay, maybe these are areas where we need to think about how to help people with housing stability, because having that um, fewer resource threshold just makes you much more vulnerable to anything that might happen. All right, so we've reached the end of the data-driven part. And so now I really wanna open it up to you all to hear about you know, what comments or questions that you have. Um, and also to like what you noticed in the data, what seemed to accurately capture um, your community's experiences, what might seem off um, or what is missing. And so um, Dothry will be monitoring the chat for online and I'll make sure that we're re responding and hearing from the folks online as well. And then um, for you, I'll open it up to you all in the room. I might repeat back some of the questions to make sure the folks online know uh, what's being said or asked. Anton? Mm -hmm. so. I'm going to paraphrase back some of what you said so that the folks online. So Anton was noting how the census tracks, uh, he sees um, like evidence of other kinds of resources um, being scarce in those communities as well. And you can see the ones that are, yeah, that are cost burdened in that dark color. Yeah, of course, if people are paying a very large percentage of their income towards rent, it's going to be difficult to afford other things as well, for sure. So that would make sense why you would be seeing um, the need for those resources in those areas too. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, they're just it's just going to keep getting because that's the way the system. Sure. So you let me make sure I'm understanding. So you're saying that you're noticing how the census tracks that are you, um, like where there's a large number of people experiencing cost burden. There's specifically incentives to build like affordable housing in that area. But even though that might sound good, it's making it so that it further concentrates the poverty. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Right. So like when you put housing there, if you don't, if you don't have the other kinds of resources in that same area, then um, like we know that people are going to be experiencing um, like shortages of other things they need is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, this, this presentation will be part of what we submit to HUD um, and the, at least the, like the people in the field office, I would be able to share, like share this that way with them. Um, yeah, I, I think having like a, a clear conversation about kind of what, what the trade-offs are when people make the decision to site housing that way is really an important thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yes, um, I, I know that some folks that we are in partnership with will definitely get to see this and will hear it. Um, and I'm glad you think that more people should be in the conversation. I think we largely agree that, you know, housing being such an important issue is something that people really do need to understand how this, like, mismatch we're seeing in um, how much households have and how much they are paying in housing is just really dire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think um, we definitely could use more coordination. Definitely. Yeah, we definitely could use like that deeper level of, of analysis. And we are starting to look at some of that alongside like the the study I mentioned related to cost burden. We have more income or more information about like what family compositions um, we have for households. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do a better job describing that relatively soon. I absolutely agree that that needs to be a part of the conversation about housing needs is you know, as people transition into um, like being senior adults, what are their housing needs and do we have enough of the kinds of things that they need? And yes, it will uh, definitely will change to what kind of housing is needs or what kind of housing is needed if we're seeing more single person households than we have previously. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead right here and then we'll come up to Pete. I don't have any insight about it. Yeah, I I could take note of that, but I I don't know for myself and um I, yeah, I don't know. Yes. If everybody wants to go ask, that sounds great. Um I an answer to that might exist, but I don't know the answer. So. Yeah. Mm 
Great. Right. Yeah, I uh, we don't we don't have the information about whether like a folk a person who lives in their home now and maybe has for some time could have purchased it um at today's price. We that is something that is is better captured in um, cost burden measures. Remember I said cost burden is not great for supply, but actually it is good for looking at how much certain kinds of housing costs have ballooned compared to maybe like what a person's income is. So the measure that we use for cost burden for homeowner housing does include property taxes, utilities, um, insurance, those kinds of costs. And so when we do see an increase in cost burden, um, some of it could be attributable to that. And, and housing cost burden in the owner market has gone up um, as well. But, you know, even if people can afford their mortgage, you're right, sometimes other pieces balloon. And then you're also, I think, highlighting just the change in housing in general is pricing out new buyers. For sure. Like if you haven't bought already, you might have been able to afford a home in a, in an area five years ago and you just can't now. Um, we're definitely, I mean, the, the evidence for that is here for sure. But mm -hmm. Right. I don't know. Do do you do we have that information? Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a good question for the folks online. He he was asking about if we had information about what type of housing is being built currently, like um single family okay but how how large what price etc i think yeah um and dothry noted that we do have some information on that um i don't know the data right off the top of my head but we could incorporate that as part of the analysis yeah um we have some of that Hmm. Hey, this is actually pulling me back. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that level of analysis would be helpful really across all the types of housing, but especially affordable housing, too, is how much mobility is there along this housing continuum? Like we want there to be, you know, of course, we want people to be able to move um, from a level of housing into one that, you know, either into home ownership or they've acquired the assets that they need to be able to afford a market rate or, you know, so on. Um, I don't. I don't know of any data set that tracks that, but it might exist. There are some some that track like how long people live in their unit, but I don't know if it's cut by their income or not. There are some that like track how long people stay in certain places. That's really interesting. I could look into that. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure that I you know, I'll give the folks online an opportunity to ask any questions if they did. Dothry, did we receive anything in the chat? Oh, you've been able to answer for them. Okay. Um, okay, well, go ahead and we may transition into the focus groups and continue this kind of discussion, but more with each other in just a second. But yes, go ahead.
So we do this needs analysis every five years. So this is preparing for our next like five year strategic plan related to those funds I talked about at the beginning. But we also, like I said, use it as our agency to better understand what the um, needs are in the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, something that I'm interested in in looking at is for the areas where we saw cost burden fall, like did did it fall because we built more housing where then people moved into um, housing that was like um, the affordable level for their income or did it did it drop because people left? it got expensive and so people moved somewhere that was cheaper. So cost burden fell, but the same people aren't living there. It, it can be tricky to tease out when you see a cost burden fall. Why? Of course we want it to be because the housing that was needed as a supply issue is provided. Um, we don't always know if that's the case. Yeah. And where do the people go? Yeah, yeah, uh, and at a faster rate than anywhere else in the state, so. Mm Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there is a way. I'm looking at DAW3 because that that is something that we're looking at in this research that we're doing right now that we're not ready to like, we didn't want to tell you something that was inaccurate, but um, our economist, Julia, has been working really hard on um, giving that type of estimate of what, um, where the shortages are for different affordable group or like groups, and also looking a little bit at like how much is it a result of mismatch, where like you know somebody who's making more money is you living in a unit for less and some things like that. So um, hopefully we'll have like very specific answers um, about or estimates about that soon. Um, I I think unless I think now might be a good time to start our transition into the focus groups. Um, and so the folks who are online are not going to be participating in that. So I want to make sure that I thank everybody uh, who's coming. I just want to highlight if you are curious about where we got the data for these different um, estimates, you can see the tables that we used on this slide here. We will be publishing this presentation online as well on THDA's research and planning website. So if you want to go back and reference it, it should be up you know, probably sometime within the next month or so. Um, and here's a few references of different um, resources that we used when we were thinking about this presentation. So thanks to everybody who joined online and thanks everybody in the room and the in-person group, we're gonna go ahead and organize for further discussion um, here in person. <laughs>